And we start with breaking news this afternoon. Two people are dead after a vehicle crashed and exploded at the border between the United States and Canada in Niagara Falls. The very top of this video, you can see a car that appears to be traveling at high speed before it launches into the air and disappears off screen. According to law enforcement, the vehicle crashed into the Rainbow Bridge checkpoint structure and caught fire and exploded. The two occupants of the vehicle are now dead and one Customs and Border Patrol officer sustained minor injuries that did not require hospitalization. Authorities did not find a secondary explosive or device. The White House says they are monitoring the situation closely, and the Canada Border Services Agency said it is working with the U.S. counterparts on this matter. The FBI is now investigating this incident and whether or not the crash was intentional. Joining us now, NBC News investigative correspondent Tom Winter, former FBI counterintelligence agent Peter Schruck is back with us and joining us by phone, former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, Frank Fagluzzi. Why don't you start, Tom, by just giving us a TikTok of how this all went down? Sure. So uh, basically what happens here, there is a vehicle uh, the color of the vehicle is white, as you saw there on screen in that mm -hmm. exclusive video. And it's traveling at a very high rate of speed. Now, a witness interview says that the vehicle at some point tries to pass or get around another vehicle, clearly hits a median, goes airborne right there as we're looking at, and then crashes into this Customs and Border Patrol facility that is part of the whole bridge security apparatus and Customs and Border uh, checkpoint apparatus at this bridge. At that point there, uh, there is a, uh, some sort of an explosion, which is what any witness would hear if they heard a car going that fast airborne. Think of it going over a fence. You can see a fence in the background there and then enters into this compound. There's an explosion. Um, and the, at that point, the fuel tank kept, uh, catches on fire, as you can see. And as you're seeing the flame wow. kind of move from left to right in this video, and we'll watch it here um, again a second time, it, it comes up again. That's very indicative of a, uh, of a flame uh, coming out of uh, the gas. As the gas starts to come out of a, of a fuel tank, tank. Uh, it'll go across the roadway, catches fire, and from there, um, it'll travel wherever the fuel goes because, of course, its tendency is to catch on fire. It's gas. So that's what we see. There is no indication, as we've been reporting with my colleague, Jonathan mm -hmm. Deans, at least for U.S. law enforcement officials, I think it's more than that now, I've lost count, have said there is no indication whatsoever that there were any explosives in the vehicle. In other words, there wasn't a bomb in the vehicle as well as the fuel tank catching on fire and exploding. There's no indication that there were any sort of secondary devices, meaning uh, a device that was uh, found outside of the vehicle. Uh, they've swept that facility. As you reported, there's a number of border crossings that are closed at this time uh, out of an abundance of caution until they get a better sense here as to what exactly happened with respect to the driver of this car who's believed to be deceased. So was this an accident? Was it a medical episode? We've seen that in the past. Uh, was it somebody trying to flee local law enforcement? I think we would have heard about that by now, but maybe they were involved in another crime and believed that they needed to flee something, and so that's why they were traveling at a high rate of speed. Or was this intentional to cause damage to this particular checkpoint? And then at that point, we have to figure out, well, what is the motive? Were they going after CBP? Were they going after the U.S. government? Was there something that was tied to what's going on in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas that led to this? And, of course, we've been in a heightened terror environment uh, for the past uh, over month, month and a half at this point because of the statements from individuals overseas. It's just too soon to know. Right. Uh, we just don't have any reporting uh, from people that have been uh, talking to folks involved in the investigation, uh, from people that have been briefed on what's going on to say with any sort of clarity exactly why this happened. Uh, but as you can see from the, all the videos we've shown you, uh, from still images we've seen from the accident scene, somebody was traveling at a very high rate of speed. It was obviously an enormous noise when this occurs, a huge fire, and the question now is, why? Frank Fagluzzi, Tom Winters lays out a series of questions, a series of possibilities. If you would, for us, pull back the curtain on the work the FBI is doing right now to investigate. Sure. And I, I think it's a sign of the heightened threat environment we're in that you see this this large scale FBI response to this and, and all the media coverage and understandably so. So the question is, while they operate from the presumption that, yes, this is terrorism because that's what the rules of the road say these days, then we start proving that it's not and, and, or, or that it is. So how do you do that? 
we've got evidence in front of us. We've got a vehicle to deal with. That vehicle, even though it's burned, has a, a, a VIN number on it. And there may be recoverable identifications of the two uh, deceased persons inside the car that will help quickly identify. Same with the license plate and all of the video coverage that, that is uh, understandably around a border crossing, not to mention back on the American side where they may have stopped at a at a convenience store or been captured on some kind of other camera coverage. All of that being done now. And as you identify who belongs to that vehicle, of course, you're, you're doing uh, you're knocking on doors of family members, loved ones. You're asking for consent to search. You're talking about devices that might even been, have been recovered in the vehicle and whether you can get social media uh, postings that might indicate something about intention here. At the same time, all that can be done and absolutely no evidence developed of any kind of affiliation with ideology that would lead us to believe that there is terrorism. This is work that's being done even as we speak, perhaps even search warrants being drawn up um, for residences and devices and communications carriers. Peter Schruck, the Buffalo Niagara International Airport has close to de departing and arriving international flights. You have Amtrak suspending service between New York and Canada. What does all of that suggest to you? Well, I think it's very consistent with both what uh, Tom and Frank indicated, that the authorities are treating this as potentially an act of terrorism. You have to assume the worst and work back from there. So I think as uh, FBI Director Ray indicated uh, very recently, the terror threat level is at its highest that it's been in many years. And so I think any time you see something like this around something of a symbolic nature of the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, the, the immediate response is going to be something, uh, some, one of caution and to make sure that public safety safety is preserved to make sure that there is a heightened level of alert and things being checked and done to maintain public safety. So in this case, when you have, you know, the, the largest FBI field, there's a Buffalo field office, which is right there at Niagara Falls. This is something that federal, state and local officials, along with their Canadian counterparts, train for and coordinate for uh, on a routine basis. So I expect this is a response uh, of being very cautious. You know, certainly we do not know uh, what classified intelligence may be available to the U.S. intelligence community, to the FBI. But in this case, I think it is uh, from everything we're seeing and certainly what Tom is reporting, uh, while there are no direct indications of terrorism, you see officials uh, approaching this event and all of the circumstances with a great deal of caution. You know, uh, Peter, it's Tom Winter. I'm, I'm thinking, I know a lot of your background and experience is in the counterintelligence field, but I know that everybody on set and talking here today is familiar with uh, over the course of the past several decades, uh, the attention that's been paid to the northern border uh, with respect to terrorism. And we have saw the Millennium Plot um, in 1999, 2000. Uh, we've seen other indications of that border being used as a possible entry point. Um, and I'm speaking about the border at large, not this specific checkpoint um, over the years. Uh, I'm wondering if that's a reason, and perhaps you can expound further and we can get into it, a reason why officials are, are so concerned, because the idea of the northern border as a potential uh, nexus to terrorism is, is certainly not a foreign one to law enforcement. Uh, well, certainly that's a good point. You know, I was uh, stationed up in Boston as my first office. I worked on the Richard Reed uh, terrorism investigation. He was the shoe bomber who attempted to explode a device on an incoming international flight. We've seen in the Millennium bombing in the state of Wisconsin or Washington out on the West Coast uh, a land entry or attempted entry by some terrorist elements. What a land entry gives you, one, is a very broad uh, space. It isn't just one airport or a series of airports. You have any number of places where you can cross the border. And of course, your ability to carry much more, uh, you know, equipment, whether that's an explosive device or other weapons, you can put a lot more into a car or a truck than you can into a suitcase, say, if you're going on to an aircraft. But again, this is something because, unfortunately, of the long experience of the United States with being alert and learning through some difficult experiences, uh, the potential threat of border crossings, that you have any number of people. I mean, certainly Customs and Border Protection routinely exercises and trains and does on a day in day out basis, you know, has developed threat indicators that as people in vehicles are coming in, they are alert for potential, you know, indicators of suspicious activity and in vehicles and so forth. So there are procedures in place. There are very close relationships, I can tell you, between the FBI, again, not just with New York State Police and CBP and DHS personnel, 
but with their Canadian counterparts. So whether that's the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, whether that is the Canadian Intelligence Services, whether that is uh, local other uh, Canadian law enforcement personnel, these are relationships that are well established. I am certain right now that there is a great deal of information that is flowing between the United States and Canada and then all across the United States government, whether that's the FBI, whether it's the U.S. intelligence community collecting overseas. Everybody is trying to figure out, and as Frank said, getting to the evidence on the ground to get positive identifications, who these people are, what communications they might have used, what phone numbers, what emails, et cetera. All of that is being pursued right now.